So let's ask you then, fascia, next. You know, that's, you know, we have these things in yoga circles, don't we? Something bubbles to the surface. Some, one time it was like mutation, counter-mutation, the sacrum. <laughs> we've, had, we've had a discussion about that ourselves, yeah. if anybody is, uh, that might come up again. Um, but um, at the moment, there's a lot of, in bodywork circles as well about fascia and uh, maybe that it influences the way we should do our practice or not. How do you, first of all, maybe explain for people what fascia is as you see it and then how it relates to the practice maybe? Okay. Um, well, first, I think it's in the forefront of everybody's mind because there's been more research in the last like five to ten mm. years on fascia than there ever has been in the history of man. Yeah. Right now, there's a fascial congress that meets yeah. every two or three years or whatever it is, which which is great because uh, they're discovering all kinds of things and disproving all kinds of other things. So, uh, well, fascia is a type of connective tissue. Most people will substitute the word fascia for connective tissue. Not technically right. It doesn't really matter. Um, and they do that because it's the most abundant type in the body. And so fascia is the specific type of connective tissue that is in and around muscles. So it's highly abundant in the body. But there's other tendons or, uh, well, they're almost related to muscles anyway, but ligaments are a type of connective tissue. You know, there's another layer under the skin and, you know, all there's all kinds of types of connective tissue going on in the body um, and related to practice uh, again we if, if we start going too far off into the science then we're going to lose some of the spirituality so yeah. it's it's finding this balance of the two the intersection is because fascia r can restrict movement if it's gummed up if it's mm. stuck if it's tight if you have scar tissue which is another type of you know connective tissue mm. um, and so that's where we're kind of intersecting with it. It's where we deal with our tension and our tightness. A component of that is the fascia or the connective tissue. The other part of that is the nerves related to the contractile function of muscles. So these things start mixing together because, you know, muscles created by tubes of fascia filled mm. in with proteins. Mm. So when we stretch a muscle, we're stretching the connective tissue or the fascia as well as um, asking the muscle, not always, but usually asking the nervous system to stop stimulating that muscle so we can lengthen it. Yeah. And that's never going to be 100% off anyway. But we're dealing with all of those things. Do you buy into the three-dimensional model of fascia? You know, permeating right the way through the body, from the superficial, oh, yeah. through the muscle, yeah. everywhere? Yeah, I buy that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And so, feeding on from that, there's some talk about the fact that fascia takes longer to respond or, or needs longer potentially in a stretch than a, a muscle does. You know, so would we change the way we practice to um, at all? Are we going into yin yoga? Mm, maybe not, I don't think. Okay. Not that far? No. Into ha holding postures that long? No. But maybe also just different... I've heard talk about, you know, um, don't be, not being so linear around the joints, exploring many of the different angles mm -hmm. around the joints, you know, because it will help spread and open in many more directions than anything like too linear. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm going, really. Okay. Um, well, there's different movement techniques and different exercises and stretching programs and yoga is, lives in some big body of movement-related... Mm. Um, art slash science slash spirituality stuff. Yeah. Um, there's something to be said for tradition, and and again, we we get out on these edges of things, and we start to then change what the tradition was. Sometimes for the better, sometimes because we just think we're doing it better. Mm. Um, you know. Yeah. Should you have fluid movement around the entirety of your joint? Yes. So instead of thinking about a practice as linear, then you internally you can access different parts even within a particular posture. Turn things on, turn things off, or you can just flop into it and be in it. Yeah. And uh, it's another place where, you know, I guess you could use anatomy to think about how you're putting pressure into particular joints. But in terms of the responsiveness of connective tissue, I, I, to be honest with you, I'd have to see, you know, what research was, was saying. Say what? Yeah. yeah sure. 
I mean, my personal experience of connective tissue is uh, it doesn't take much more than about, unless it's really stuck, mm. within about five to ten seconds of having pressure on it, whether that's coming from fingertips or coming from body weight, gravity, and tension being yeah. added to it by, like, you know, holding your foot and pulling yeah. yourself forward, within five to ten seconds it starts to loosen and give. How long you need to stay there for effectiveness, you know, that's holding a stretch has been debated for a very long time yeah. now yeah. and the average number that always comes up is about 30 seconds yeah which equates to sort of about five breaths doesn't it five six five breaths. to eight breaths yeah, yeah somewhere in there mm. and i mean look at look at the result you can watch people do ashtanga where they only hold it for five breaths and you yeah. see people's bodies change yeah. within one year yeah and it's much more to do with consistency of practice than it is with that, that the fact that they're holding it for a short amount of time versus holding it a long amount of time. Yeah. So if you do a long held posture once a week. Yeah. It doesn't mean, you know, anything's going to change. No. no. You touched on it just now. We were talking about the nervous system, physical body. How much of, uh, we call it, we can either call it range of motion around a joint or flexibility. How much is that? governed by the nervous system and how much is but so now we're not talking about in mm. within the five breaths we're talking maybe about just a six general. month program right how much is about the reprogramming of the nervous system shall we say and how much of it is about physical change to the muscle length what do you think do you want to include um, connective tissue and sure. bone structure as well yeah why yeah not? why not we can, we've got all our <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you have to you want to look at it in as from the point of view of all of the possibilities that could be restricting range of motion, mm. right? So how far can we move a joint? The deepest level, potential level of restriction is the bone structure. And I know a lot has been made out of bone structure and um, it's certainly a possibility. Um, most of us live in a range of motion that's average. And then yeah. there's a few outliers in both directions. You know, it's like a typical bell curve. You know, there's 5% out who are super flexible, 5% yeah. who are, their bone shape just won't allow them to do something. Yeah. And then on top of that is the ligamentous structures that allow for restrict movement at joints. Yeah. So it's possible that, you know, if ligaments are particularly tight, they add to restriction. If your ligaments are generally loose, they'll allow for more, which gets into the connective tissue end of things. And then at that point, I would say you're dealing with the neuromuscular relationship, the nervous system feeding the muscle, creating tension. And then that kind of cohabitates with the fascial tension yeah. at that level. Regardless of which one it is, the only one we can change is really the neuromuscular fascial component that's yeah, the only we one we can do anything. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. And the ligaments, yeah. probably not a good idea to overstretch too yeah. many ligaments. Because yeah. uh, then the joints move around too much and they wear and arthritis and all that kind of stuff sets in. Uh, it's something I talk a lot about in the workshop, which is, you know, neuromuscular patterns. Mm -hmm. We all have sort of patterns of movement, ways of moving from things that we've done. If we've trained to be a footballer or... Uh, play tennis or golf or dance or gymnastics, whatever that is, you're training your body to move in a very, very particular way. Probably the most common patterns are running and cycling, and I usually pick on the runners and the cyclists a little bit. Yeah. Not because I don't like running and cycling, <laughs> I not that I do it, but just because... Easy targets. Well, it's, it's very um, contrary to yoga, yeah. especially because of the hips and how open... Yeah. We really want the hips to be in our yoga practice. Um, so we're up against these old patterns and we're trying to retrain those patterns. So there's a component of letting the patterns go and then feeding the opposite muscles in terms of strength to help create balance yeah. there again. We always want to look at both sides of that equation. It's not like we're just trying to stretch stuff. We're also trying to strengthen stuff. And how can we do that in our practice? How do we, because I'm very mindful of that, that, you know, people quite often get injured because of, they've got too much flexibility and not enough strength around the same sort of areas. They can't control that flexibility. Yeah, I would say, I, I, I've worked with a few students this way. I don't let them go all the way into postures. I make them hold before the edge of the posture okay. so that they have to engage yeah. the muscles. 
Like they don't have a choice. Yeah. Because otherwise they'll just be flopping into the end of their range of motion and they'll yeah. just be feeding that that flexibility but not yeah. working on this. So just I pull them out a little bit. Okay. Make them engage. They're Strong not engaging, legs. Working against gravity. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the. I I don't know what else I could do. Some postures are going to feed it in one direction. Other postures feed it in another direction. Some postures you feel that strength component to it, don't you? Yeah. yeah of course, inversions, handstands, all mm. you know, all of that kind of stuff. You would definitely feel. It's like I I look at every pose is made of a combination of strength, flexibility, and technique. Mm. And the technique is broad. You know, it could be include breath and bandha and yeah. all that stuff. But it's always some combination of those things. 